from New York City. For our viewers worldwide, I'm Anna Scranny in for Jonathan Ferrer. A spirited attempt by equities to bounce back after six days of losses. Tesla is consumed by chaos. We'll dig into that as we count you down to the open. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Coming up on the show, futures tick higher after six straight days of losses. Earnings season kicks in with the busiest week arriving on Wall Street. And as I said, Tesla announces another round of price cuts. We begin with a big issue. It is crunch time for big tech. For as long as I can remember this year, it's been all about the right tail, about that FOMO and MOMO. And I really think the biggest inflection point difference is that left tail is waking up. And, you know, I just want to say one thing. Look, it's not that NVIDIA hasn't sold off before. We've seen that happen. It's the first time, though, in auctions where that left tail has picked up because of it. It is all about the left tail risk. Morgan Stanley's Brian Weinstein and Bank of America's Matt Dezoc join me now. Gentlemen, good to see you this morning. Left tail risk rises in equity markets. It's up by 45 basis points of a jolt higher in yields. Brian, is the left tail risk priced in bonds but not equities? No, I don't think that's right. I mean, I think the equity market gets that that bond yields here are a risk, and they've sold off accordingly. There's some challengers out there now for for equities if you want to own some income. So I think the market has done an appropriate job of starting to adjust for the fact that it's not all right tail risk. Things do go down. Things can correct. Throw in some geopolitical and some political and you know some some debt issues, and I think we've adjusted fairly accurately. I'm being disingenuous then to the equity market. <laughs> Good morning to you, Matt. How are you doing? Um, left tail hey, risks, how, how do you assess them? Um, and how do you feel in terms of the mechanics of pricing into the bond market relative to the equity market, given that you're slightly more fixed income? Yeah, listen, we feel good about the repricing in bond markets. We think it's appropriate. We think clearly the bond market got ahead of itself in January when it was expecting a seven Fed cuts. So from a big picture perspective, nothing's really changed here. Uh, the Fed spent a lot of time last year talking about higher for longer. They'd gotten the tenure up to that 5% level, which was the right place to be, and try and slow the economy, bring inflation down. But then they got talking too dovishly, and the market got ahead of themselves. But the main drivers we're seeing, deficits still too high, about 6% of GDP. Liquidity still too much. The Fed actually didn't drain reserves of the last year. The Fed increased reserves unintentionally from 2.8 to 3.6 trillion. So too much liquidity, too much spending. They need to keep rates higher for longer to get the economy down. And rates rising now is a good uh, provides a good ability for clients to extend duration, take advantage of higher nominal, but more importantly, nominal higher real rates in this environment. That's a good opportunity uh, for folks in fixed income markets. Okay, uh, you and the real money uh, should, in theory, arrive. That's of course in case. The Fed doesn't raise rates. Um, let's talk about the traders, what they're bracing for this week. It's going to be a busy week on the economics data front. We've got Bloomberg's Mike McKee in the studio to set the agenda. I don't know whether I've got four days of volatility in me until the PC on Friday. Mike, good morning. <laughs> well, we are going to have a little bit of a wait, Manus, to get the numbers that are really going to matter and could affect interest rates for those who are worried about them in the equity markets. We're backloaded Thursday, GDP. Uh, the fourth quarter was very strong. The first quarter consensus is 2.5%, but the Atlanta Fed says it could be 2.9, so upside risk there. And then PCE headline and core both expected to come in on a month-over-month -month basis about the same way, but as with CPI, the headline goes up on a year-over-year -year basis. The core goes down. We'll see how the markets react to that. Also Friday, personal income and personal spending expected to be strong. People will still have money to spend, and they're probably still spending it. Now, the question is, how does the Fed react to all this? Well, guess what? <laughs> we're not going to know. Here's the calendar for Fed speak this week. Yeah, we're in the blackout period, so there is no Fed speak this week. So you just got to wait until the 1st of May for them to react with their decision. We will get a view, though, on rate cuts from the markets right now. Here's where we are. 
November is seen barely as the first time we get a one rate cut and then we get one and a half by December. So somewhere in that time period is what the market is thinking. But if we can get a drop in inflation or a rise in inflation on Friday, those will probably move around quite a bit. Well, uh, let's see. As you say, that's fairly anemic. One in November, one and a half by December. Mike, thank you very much. Uh, my guests this morning are Brian Weinstein and Matt Dezog. Gentlemen, when I look at the PC, we've had the PPI, we've had the CPI, we've had the jolts, we, we've had a bit of a jolt in that. How would, do you perceive the train of disinflation? Because I'm looking at what Apollo are writing. They're saying you're going to need a print. You're going to need a print of point. 1% on the PC all the way through to December to hit the target of 2%. Brian, do you think that we are on that kind of a trajectory for disinflation? I don't no, think so. No, I, I don't think so. I, I also don't think the Fed needs that to ease, right? I mean, remember, 5.5% where we are now was a reaction to inflation going up to 8 and 9%. So inflation doesn't have to go 0.1, 0.1 forever uh, to, to get to That is to, to hit to target. Ease. I should, that's you know, I qualify. That is to, yeah, that is right. to hit, target. hit target. Yeah. And we can debate the target, right? I mean, I think we're inching up in break even. So I think the market gets that we're not going right back to 2. But that doesn't mean the Fed can't ease two or three times this year um, in order to ensure the soft landing that, that they want. So I still think. Listen, seven was too many. Um, we were on that. Um, I think at one and a half, you get paid to make the bet. Maybe not today, but over the next couple of months, that we will have some prints that point back towards that two to three percent range, and the Fed can uh, normalize rates a little bit. By the way, it may cause tenure notes to go higher, so it's not a free lunch easing a little bit. It might cause the market to overreact and, and fear more about future inflation. But I do think the Fed will ease um, uh, two or three times uh, later on this year. And maybe that is what takes us to five percent. Um, uh, Matt, in terms of the road to disinflation, as Brian just said, we can debate where the higher natural rate is or the normal rate. We can debate um, when the Fed can begin to cut. But the risk of disinflation is challenged by oil. It is challenged by a whole host of other quasi-inflationary issues, not least geopolitics. The road to disinflation, how bumpy will it be? Continued disinflation. It should be a little bit bumpy from here. Again, we don't want to worry too much about one before January, February, or March. You've got to realize we're dealing with two important lags here. First of all, inflation itself is a lagging indicator. It doesn't tell us what's happening or what's going to happen. It tells us what happened. So that's one lag we have to worry about. So even if the, as long as the disinflation is on the right trend, the Fed can start to cut. But it's sort of plateaued here. Um, and you're hearing talk of the consumer being interest rate insensitive or rate hikes not working. Way too early to be saying that. We hear this sort of every time. The news cycle, uh, uh, that, that, that lag is a lot shorter than the monetary policy lag. The monetary policy lag is, uh, is 12 to 24 months. And we just got the 10-year to peak in October of November, October, November of last year. The Fed funds rate just hit five and three. It's in July of last year. So we're not even into that one-year period. So don't say rate hikes aren't working. Come back to us uh, in 2025 and tell us if rate hikes haven't worked. And from a lot of the anecdotal data I'm seeing, traveling and seeing clients, the slowdown is starting to bite and give it another 12, uh, 18 months. Uh, the Fed will probably get what it, what it wants, which is disinflation to continue, but as you know, it on a bumpier path. Just briefly, Matt, when you're on the road talking to clients, 12 to 18 months out, the, the trajectory forward, is there some kind of material break or is it just a slow, quiet, silent, assassin-like slowdown? <laughs> well, it doesn't seem that it's going to be a huge break, and we certainly hope there's not a huge break, and the Fed is attuned to stop a huge break. But if you talk to commercial real estate developers in the Southwest and the West, they're starting to feel the pain of higher rates. You talk to uh, the, an owner of an auto dealership, sales are way down. A lot of folks are taking their leases and buying those car backs instead of buying new cars or being able to lease um, uh, at a higher price. You talk to restaurant owners, um, uh, Saturdays, uh, Sundays are still pretty good. Wednesdays, Thursdays, not as good. So again, you're seeing what you usually see. You're seeing rate hikes, you're seeing the economy slow. It's not even. There has been an influx of labor that's balancing the supply and demand picture on the labor front, which is keeping wages in check. But again, the big jump in prices is still biting people's pocketbooks. We do think rate hikes are working. We do think five and three eights should be the high for the cycle. And if they're wrong, they just need to keep rates at that level. Uh, again, maybe one, hike, one cut this year, but likely hikes are out of the picture. And if that's the case, 
then real rates at that low 2% level, 2 to 2.5% across the curve, that will look quite attractive in a couple of years' time. Yeah, I mean, the reason why probably they're not busy on a Wednesday or Thursday night is because we're actually back at the office and, and the work from home. <laughs> uh, the ability to stay up a little bit late on a Wednesday night has dissipated. Brian, uh, when, when you look at the IMF meetings last week, it was very interesting. A couple of big themes, really, really prevalent. Um, the duration of the United States policy on strong dollar, uh, but also the growth, the growth differential for the United States. The IMF upgrades growth to 2.7% from 2.1%. You get a flash reading this week. But this underpins, in part, your thesis on credit. Yeah, listen, uh, listen. The U.S. government keeps spending, and uh, and, and growth keeps going up. I don't, or, or stays high, so I don't think it's that surprising. The outlook on credit, I think, is good. In fact, I think with all this noise about what a bad borrower the U.S. government is is acting like, I think credit looks even better. So I think you're going to see continued tights in credit spreads. I'm not sure it's logical, but I do think people are avoiding the government because the headlines are bad. Take your extra spread. Earnings are good. Earnings estimates keep going up. Um, the Fed could ease a little bit to help, and so I think credit is is on a is continuing used to be on a really good trajectory, and you can earn income while waiting. So I like credit, even though it seems rich here. I think it's a good environment for credit. What about a bit of credit for, for you, Matt, on the other side? I mean, what, what is, did you just say the bad actor, which is the government, or what, was that the phrase, the bad actor was the government, so stay away from sovereigns and, and eat a bit of credit? How does credit look for you, Matt? Uh, we don't disagree with a lot of what Brian is saying, and we agree. The conditions look good for credit. We're not concerned about the trends in credit. We do think it's actually rational. At the end of the day, a diversified invest investment-grade bond portfolio does not deliver you a lot of credit losses. Even though it's a credit product, 95% plus of the spread you get is really for liquidity, for mark-to-market -market risk, for spread risk. And so in an environment where the Fed is attuned to put the fires on any liquidity risks, Premiums should be tighter. But from our perspective, right now, uh, investment grade credit, municipals, high yield are all pricing in a donut, not a zip, zilch, zero chance of a recession. That's a little bit uh, too much for us. So we're slightly underweight credit risk here and actually slightly overweight rate risk. A preference for treasuries, a preference for agency mortgage backed securities. They've already extended. People are not going to prepay their 2% mortgages. So we do like yeah. taking additional uh, uh, risk on the rate risk side. But again, it's a slight modest tilt to rate risk. Again, conditioned on these higher real rates, which we find on a 20-year time frame to be quite attractive. I just let you both in on a secret. I've still got a, I've still got a base plus an eighth mortgage. There you go. <laughs> Never in the history of money will anybody ever price a mortgage again at base plus, it was called LIBOR. It was called LIBOR plus an eighth, but it's base plus an eighth of 1%. That's the Brits for you. Now, the one big issue as well is get ready for an oil shock. And the fixed income market, to a certain extent, has grappled with $90 in brand. It, it's, it, it's unsure that you're going to get an oil shock. To what extent, uh, Brian, do you worry about an oil shock? And does the fixed income market, has it even computed that as a left tail risk? Yeah, listen, you worry about it a little bit, certainly on days when uh, when the drones are in the air, and, and, and it does come up. Listen, I don't think the market, the market doesn't price geopolitical risk that well. It tends to overreact during the event and over the weekends where, where things may happen. So no, listen, if oil goes, you know, into the 90s, into the 100s, I think you have to reevaluate, right? It hurts the consumer. Um, it's inflationary, but it also slows growth. There are certain companies and industries that it really, really goes after. Listen, I think we're on a, tra on a trajectory for energy prices to grind higher over the coming years as we just use more of it and, and, and haven't produced enough. Uh, or don't have enough refineries and things of the like. Uh, but no, I don't think the market is priced for an oil spike, and, um, and I don't think the market is efficient enough to know if that's coming or not and to, and to play it correctly. Matt, in 30 seconds, fit or kill on oil as, as a material risk, or are you okay so long as it stays sub 100 bucks? Not a material risk, difference between inflationary pressures and actual inflation. Uh, oil price goes up, does not mean people are going to spend more in cars and still spend everything else. Oil prices go up, they're going to spend less. Oil price hike might actually work like a rate hike, help slow the economy. Again, differentiate between inflationary pressures and actual inflation. We, we think the consumer is going to feel the pinch a little bit, spend less elsewhere, and we're not worried about higher oil prices transferring to higher inflation economy-wide. 
Okay, uh, nice and succinct. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being with me. That's Matt Dezok uh, and Brian Weinstein on the bond markets this morning. Join me now. Let's go under the hood. 14, 16 minutes to go until the opening bell rings. Abigail Doolittle has the detail. Abby. Well, we're looking at the possibility of something that we've not seen over the last six trading sessions, Manus, and that, of course, is an up day. Helping out right now in the pre-market, Verizon shares are higher, up more than 2%. They beat adjusted earnings by nearly 3%. There was a small revenue miss, but investors and analysts really like the fact that they affirmed the outlook for the year plus saying that the wireless business trends, some analysts are saying, are solid. Now, Salesforce.com up adding to previous gains, up 4.1%. The early news was that the deal talk between this company and Informatica had broken down. Well, we just have breaking news now. Informatica not engaged in acquisition talks uh, to be acquired. They've also uh, pre-announced uh, for their first quarter saying revenue subscription uh, should be in the upper half of the range. So trying to assure investors as we now have the news that Informatica and Salesforce uh, will not be uh, merging together. And then Tesla down four and a quarter percent. The latest price cuts in China are weighing on EBIT and could, in fact, weigh on profits in that area. Tesla now, Manus, is down a stunning more than 40 percent this year alone. Yeah, I mean, the headline is chaos at Tesla. They spend the weekend cutting prices. We'll dig into that shortly. Abby, thank you very much. And as I just said, there are no shortage of problems at Tesla. They're going to make autonomy robo-taxis five, six years from now. We're talking right now, you're at the edge of a cliff. It's for Musk to bring it back, fork in the road, navigate through this Category 5 storm. Well, Tesla faces the seventh consecutive day of declines, announcing another major round of price cuts ahead of Tuesday's earnings. The conversation and context on Bloomberg. This is the period for Musk. Lay it out. Don't just talk talk. Walk the walk. Because the benefit of the doubt's not there. Yeah. And this has gone from a Cinderella story to essentially Friday the 13th. Cinderella to a Category 5. It has been a rough weekend. I mean, Tesla's spending that, cutting prices here in the U.S., in China, and in Europe. The stock goes for a seventh day uh, of declines after announcing another round of price cuts, with the quarterly results just 24 hours away. Ed Ludlow scans the distance. A Category 5 storm is coming our way, Ed. What can Elon Musk do? The genius, they say, to close the gap between genius and chaos. Yeah, I think some clarity would go a long way on the earnings call, uh, you know, in 36 hours time. Uh, you know, over the weekend, clearly in the United States, cutting the price of FSD by a third to 8,000 is in line with a growing picture on strategy, all in on, on the idea of autonomy and robo-taxi. In China, it's really interesting because the mix or blend of sales skewed towards China has been important for the bottom line. The concern is that, that the price cuts continuing and deepening in China mean that those units sold there may not even hit break even from an EBIT perspective and have negative EBIT. Um, and, and take all of this in its entirety. The layoffs continued last night. They, we reported as part of the big take that Musk was targeting not more than 10%, as he said in his internal memo and regulatory filing, but it will probably be nearer to 20%. Around 20,000 staff or more uh, will be gone. And so I think investors just look at it and say, just give us a sign or a signal what the big picture is here. Well, the market hasn't taken the sign of a 10% headcount cut as being something constructive. And if we're hanging our hats on robo taxis, um, is that a pipe dream relative to what it actually is? Robo taxis are not going to turn the entire narrative of Tesla around, or correct me, feel free. No, it's, it's a really good question. Historically, in the technology industry, you know, job cuts signal prudence. Investors cheer that because they think, it, it, you know, lower costs protect the bottom line. What I reported over the weekend is that the, the headcount reduction had nothing to do with targeting cost savings, really. My understanding is that Musk was pretty angry at the first quarter deliveries. He said if deliveries were down 20% sequentially, we should cut headcount by 20%. Why keep everyone on their to uh, toes? 
classic Elon Musk psychology, paranoia that they've got too big. And it doesn't relate to RoboTaxi either. I think that you know Musk has been away from but Tesla. But respectfully, Ed, there's, no, there's nothing particularly genius-like about that. That is GE reincarnated. That was yes. the GE philosophy 30 years ago when I worked for them. There's nothing genius about keeping the bottom quartile discombobulated. So this is my point, and this is my understanding, you know, from dozens of, of phone calls in the last seven days. I think Elon Musk has been away doing other things, and he's come back to Tesla and looked at everything that's happened and said, right, I'm actually going to get back and hands-on now. And the thing is that all of these things are happening in parallel, the layoffs, the pivot to robo-taxi, the rethink on a $25,000 EV, um, and that's why this earnings call in 24 hours' time is so important. We're on track for the first year-on-year -year drop in revenue since the second quarter of 2020, a 40% drop in operating income. And I think investors in the short, medium, and long term are just a bit confused about what the plan is here because of lots of contradictory reports from the media and statements from Elon Musk on social media. They just want to know what's the plan and how are we going to get out of this trough. What do you think changes the narrative tomorrow? Uh, I think it's the idea that... Uh, $25,000 EV, I think, was highly misunderstood. Investors, particularly those most bullish on, on Tesla on, on the street, the institutionals, thought that basically the Honda Civic of the EV world was crucial to the bull thesis long term. I don't think Tesla really ever was singularly focused on this like really cheap individual product. I think they did a lot of work to wring out cost on the component side, on the production side. And if Elon Musk goes on the call and just explains we did a lot of work to bring costs down. So in the future, we can offer a much cheaper EV in multiple variants. The street will go, OK, we understand now. That's muddied by the robo-taxi. And, and even though we have a date, August 8th, for, for a reveal of a robo-taxi, I don't think anyone really understands what it is that's being revealed. Is it a prototype? Does it have a steering wheel? Does it, does it not? Quite straightforward questions. And I think that there is a chance those questions will be asked by the sell side. Whether he answers them or not remains to be seen. OK, uh, let's see what tomorrow brings. Uh, thank you so much. Great context. Uh, we look forward to seeing you and Caroline a little bit later on, digging deeper into the Tesla story. Coming up, your morning calls. Uh, and it's uh, busiest week for earnings season. We'll set the stage with Sanctuary Wells. Mary Ann Bartal, she joins me for that conversation around the opening bell on Bloomberg. So it's a spirited attempt by equities with some green on the screen. You're going to have a monster week in terms of reporting. $18 trillion worth of market cap reports. UBS goes to neutral from overweight on big tech. Mag6 leaves the rest. There's not much uh, left to play with. Uh, that's steady play on the equities on the way up. Your morning calls look a little bit like this. The scribes of Wall Street have penned. Morgan Stanley upgrades Alcoa to equal weight, pointing to a recent cost control measures and improving valuation. JP Morgan resumes its coverage of Cisco with a neutral rating, seeing limited upside given the company's muted outlook. And finally, Stifel upgrades Papa John's to a hold, highlighting reasonable expectations and weakening competition. Papa John's pizza. There you go. Marianne Bartels joins me shortly to talk you through your risk on markets on Bloomberg. of the S&P 500 will deliver the verdict on the first quarter. What will big tech deliver? That is the question. You're going to hear from Tesla. You're going to hear from the MAG4 this week. NASDAQ up six-tenths of one percent. Some of these stocks are trying to do a spirited attempt at a turnaround. NVIDIA down 10 percent on Friday, over $200 billion lost in value. It's a small bounce back there this morning. The Russell up a uh, half of one percent on the broader market. We're counting down to the PCE this week. Uh, you are looking at the dollar up, the euro down again. Uh, the momentum in this rates market is a trajectory higher uh, and a stronger dollar. You're looking at 10-year yields taken up by two basis points. How much of the $183 billion of paper, twos, fives and sevens and auctions this week can be absorbed easily with no indigestion? Oil is down, down by one and a quarter percent as we see new sanctions on Iran's oil sector. We see an uneasy calm in the Middle East. 
Uh, and indeed, what you're seeing here is a reversion as geopolitics reduces ever so slightly. So the market returns uh, to perhaps some of the supply and demand, the basics of this market. Right now, the market tipping to the downside this morning. One stock to watch is Tesla. You can't talk enough about this stock at the moment. The EV maker cutting its model prices over the weekend. China and Europe uh, is where they took out most of the price cuts. Um, and this is on the driver assistance software in the U.S. Ed, driver assistance software, you were telling me that this is something you had to do before you got to buy your Tesla. I mean, again, it's the, the, the bank of hope, isn't it, in terms of the story of Tesla? Yeah, I, so... Uh, FSD was cut from $12,000 to $8,000 if you pay up front. Musk had already moved to make it a much cheaper subscription at $99 a month from $199 a month. Down 4.6% at the open, bouncing around. But Tesla is on track for its seventh straight day of declines, something that hasn't happened since December of 2022. From a market cap perspective, we're now below $450 billion of market cap. And as you've been talking about, the decline now well beyond 40% year to date. The price cuts particularly concerning in China to the sell side. There is a note out from Evercore, for example, saying that, well, actually, if you look at how deeply they've cut prices in China, the mix uh, of China versus US built product, traditionally, China has been supportive of the bottom line because of its margin profile. There's a concern from that name that we might not even have break even EBIT on those China built models uh, and possibly negative EBIT. That's a concern. So take it holistically. We have earnings in 24 hours time where consensus is for revenue to drop for the first time year on year since the second quarter of 2020. Uh, to, uh, 2020 and uh, operating incomes drop 40 percent and in the backdrop you have all of these layoffs musk had said it would be more than 10 percent my understanding is that it will be well beyond 10 percent nearer to 20 percent and the directive that musk gave according to my sources is that when uh one q deliveries were down 20 percent sequentially he turned around to the business leaders and said if we're down 20 percent on deliveries we need to cut headcount 20 percent to stay kind of psychologically fresh so there's lots of questions going into this call read the big take that we wrote i feel we gave some clarity on where we stand robo taxi versus a twenty-five thousand dollar ev but at the end of the day it's for Musk to come onto the call with other executives and explain to investors what's happening the stock now down more than five percent in monday session manas yep well certainly webbush securities were with us last week and they said model two is the holy grail within this pipeline of, uh, of cash generation, and that's where we really want clarity. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, more reporting through the day. Uh, Bloomberg Tech will be uh, on in just a couple of hours. Let's turn our attention to software because Salesforce and their takeover talks with Informatica have cooled as both parties struggle to agree terms, according to a person familiar with the matter. It looks as if it's dead in the water, Abigail. Indeed, because the talks have not only cooled, but uh, just recently Informatica coming out and saying that they are not being acquired. So the point of contention, because of course this story emerged uh, just a week ago with the idea that Salesforce would acquire uh, Informatica, the service uh, software company, uh, for more than $10 billion. It would have been one of their largest acquisitions, despite the fact that CEO Mark Benioff last year said that they were cooling off on the M&A. So a lot of people disappointed, but what Informatica investors would have been disappointed by was that that offer, the projected offer, was less than where the shares had traded prior to that announcement. And before Informatica saying the deal is off this morning, just moments ago, uh, the sticking point, the cooling point uh, was price. So at this point, we do have Salesforce.com up 3.2 percent. It's best day since uh, February. On the other hand, Informatica Manus, it is over since April 15th, about a week ago when this possibility was first announced, it is down more than 15 percent. So those investors really disappointed by the idea that it will not be acquired, the company won't be acquired. Informatica trying to assuage investors to some extent, saying, reiterating the full year guidance and also saying that the current quarter, well, it's at the high end of the range. Abby, thank you very much. Let's turn to China. Tencent publishing the popular game Dungeon and Fighter Mobile in China on May the 21st after seven years of development. Is it worth the wait? Katie Greifer will weigh in with Mark Soliter. Well, this is big news in the gaming world. Like you said, just to reiterate, Tencent, it will publish Nexon's Dungeon and Fighter Mobile in China. That's its China debut on May 21st. And that spurred a rally in shares of both companies as that date 
is earlier than expected. Now, Citigroup out with a note saying that the market is, quote, likely to see this as a positive development for Tencent's second quarter and second half of this year game revenues. And that is a much needed boost. If you think back to Tencent's last reported earnings, remember that its core gaming business, it showed further signs of weakness. Its segment it missed estimates for a third consecutive quarter with weaker monetization of two of its key games. So we'll see how Dungeon & Fighter is actually received, of course, in May, but there's plenty of optimism in the ADRs today. You can see Tencent currently up by more than 4%. Okay, Kenny, thank you very much. And we are going to have a big week of earnings. Let's kick it off with Verizon. Uh, they beat on the profit estimates while boosting the wireless service revenue, even as it lost retail phone customers. Balancing the books, Simone has the detail. Yeah, Manus, it lost 158,000 consumer wireless customers, but said if that's actually the best quarter uh, on a performance basis for best first quarter since 2018. So the, those loss of customers was less than expected, and that was therefore good news. The company also said that more people chose premium plans and in price increases, that helped boost profits. It saw earnings per share come in at $1.15 versus an estimated $1.12. Slight miss in consumer and business revenue, but also reiterated its outlook for, for wireless service revenue growth, uh, two to three and a half percent this year. On the positive end, its internet business uh, boomed. It added a net 437,000 broadband customers. That's the largest increase in more than a decade for a quarter. City said these results are a solid start for the year, but they did warn that broadband market market may be slowing. However, we are see us on track for the biggest gain in these shares oh, now since March. It had been since January uh, as shares rally up uh, well over one and a half percent, Manus. Simone, thank you very much. Stock is bid this morning. Our next guest writes this. Equity markets are showing signs of fatigue. The recent rise in interest rates due to stronger economic data and firm Fed speak shook the markets is the worst past. Sanctuary Wealth, Mary Ann Bartels with me. Four and a half percent down in six sessions. Is that a light nap or the beginning of something more brutal and more tiring? Well, we came into the year expecting both the equity market and the bond market to be bucking. We called it, you know, the bucking bull. Bonds have certainly, in, in the whole fixed income uh, spectrum, have bucked a lot more this year. This is the real first bucking we're getting from the equity markets. But we have to put this into perspective. The markets have been in an upward trajectory since the lows of October, and the S&P at its high was up 30%. We're in a natural correction. You can correct up to one-third to one-half of any move. So we are down to around the 100-day moving average for the S&P. NASDAQ's already through that. So the risk is, is that we're still going to have a little bit more bucking. We could have a little bit of a rally because markets are oversold. But the risk is, is that we test the 200-day moving average where we get a full 10 to 11 percent correction. But we're buyers of, of the market. So we're running into some pretty big, important announcements in MAG4 this week from Tesla, chaos, or genius, you know, we, we will make up our mind tomorrow. NVIDIA will come a, a, a little bit further down in May. As you look at the event risk this week, um, what is it that could upset the equity market the most? Is it big notes like UBS who've downgraded to neutral on, on MAG6? They say investors attribute the run in the mega cap stocks to animal spirits and the impact of AI. However, our work indicates that surging earnings momentum fueled this update. Unfortunately, that momentum is collapse, collapsing. Are you that doubtful on the earnings within the MAG, well, you can call it MAG6 or MAG7, whatever you want. Are you doubtful on the momentum of the earnings? Earnings were supposed to fill the gap here. Well, if you look at uh, street analysts and what they're estimating for MAG7, it's the strongest pocket of earnings, and it has been, and it's expected to continue. But where I think you can get the market moving uh, as these companies report, you know, the, the earnings are looking backwards. Analysts want to see where numbers are going forwards. So what companies are saying about their business and where they see their business going, I think is going to be a lot more important to the behavior uh, of the market. And then on Friday, we get 4PCE, and that could be another market mover. 
Now, data has been market movers since 2023. I mean, data moves markets. The question is, can earnings sustain their momentum? And when we look at the economy, at least the Atlanta uh, GDP Now model is estimating that the economy is growing almost at 3%. Yeah. And companies have been able to maintain their margins, and we think margins have troughed uh, and have bottomed and can actually grow. So we think the outlook for earnings overall remains very robust, which is the one of the reasons why we want to buy this pullback. Okay, I, and, and that, that, that adds up. You warn very clearly, though, that oil prices are a malevolent risk to the narrative. We just had two guests there now that said sort of maybe higher oil prices might be something the Fed would welcome because it's not, it's not necessarily inflationary, but it cools down the growth in the market. You warn about the folly of higher oil prices. You're okay with it, sub 100 bucks is my general read. Um, and you still believe that it is a sector. The S&P Energy in Index is at a 15-year breakout. Does that endure at around this $90 level? So when I look at the energy complex, what we had warned clients, especially as the tensions uh, started to build uh, in, in the Middle East, is what would derail a rally in the market? Would be crude oil going above 100 and staying above 100? Because that would be negative for corporates, it would be negative for the consumer, and it would eventually slow down the economy and we think would have a negative impact on earnings. And that has not materialized. Crude oil has really been able to hover in this 85 or let's say 80 to 90 range, which we think is sustainable for, for a growing economy. But when we look at the energy stocks, they're the cheapest assets within the market. They've delevered their balance sheet. Many of the large companies pay really nice dividends. So we think you can own energy, but we don't think they're leaders in the market. They fall into the value camp, and we still think that growth is going to be the main driver. But if you're looking to add income and growing income in your portfolio, we would own some energy stocks here. And I love what you say. You want to rent the small caps and own the big caps. How much, of, how much renting of small caps do you want to do? So when we have secular trends in the market, they can last 15 to 20 years. And right now, we're in a large cap secular bull market. In fact, I'd argue right now it's a mega cap cycle. So although the small caps have a lot of um, attractive companies and attractive valuations, we don't think they get traction until the market moves away from growth to value. What would do that? An abundance of earnings. Fund managers become very selective in their valuation when we have an abundance of earnings for the S&P companies, and we're not there yet. The earnings are still very concentrated and very concentrated in tech, so we think the market will stay growth for now. Okay, Marianne, thank you so much. Marianne Bartels uh, with her warnings on growth and value. Coming up, the clock is ticking on TikTok. The idea that we would give the Communist Party this much of a propaganda tool, as well as the ability to scrape 170 million, American, million Americans' personal data, it is a national security risk. The House passing TikTok legislation and sending it to the Senate. That conversation next with Amory Hordern. The idea that we would give the Communist Party this much of a propaganda tool, as well as the ability to scrape 170 million, American, million Americans' personal data, it is a national security risk. The timeline of giving this can be a complicated transaction. To give it up to a full year, I think just from a business standpoint, makes sense. TikTok back in the spotlight on Capitol Hill over the weekend. The House fast-tracking legislation forcing the company's Chinese parent, ByteDance, to divest its ownership stake by trying it, by tying it, I should say, to an aid package for Ukraine and Israel. TikTok pushing back, writing a memo to the staff, quote, at the stage that the bill is signed, we will move to the courts for a legal challenge. Will that be worth having at that juncture. Amri Hordern is with me now. Let's flick it on its head. I mean, TikTok potentially being divested from ByteDance. They will challenge it. Lay out 
the rationale, just once again, on why the government here want TikTok, as it were, to be moved away from ByteDance. What is the simple rationale? No, the simple rationale and the concern that you hear a lot in Washington is the national security concerns around TikTok, the algorithm, and the concern that they have is that this data, American data, can be accessed by China, by the Chinese Communist Party, which is why TikTok has gone to great lengths to try to keep some of that data in the United States. They've done this thing called Project Texas, but it doesn't seem like any of this has had the ability to assuage concerns of these officials. So we've been talking about for years now whether or not TikTok, potentially there could be a ban in the United States or divestment. But it, and what's that's the value what in the divested right version of TikTok? ByteDance divests itself of TikTok, that vehicle needs to have the algo technology that allows it to be special, the special sauce in the algos. My question is, if ByteDance sells off or hives off TikTok in the United States of America, what's the value? Because we know Steve Mnuchin and a few other people want to bid for it, potentially. Right. There could be potentially a consortium of investors who want to get action on this or a massive Big Ten company that maybe would want to what buy it, but then a potentially that would be regula regulatory issues. Dan Ives this morning put out a note following all this news at the House over the weekend and the fact that the Senate is set to vote tomorrow on these bills, mm -hmm. that the House voted on four bills, the Senate is getting one big bill, is the fact that if you're not going to have the algorithm with it, what is the point of buying this? Which is why many people say potentially this is going to be a ban. I look to Terry Haynes, who we spoke to earlier this morning. He's an analyst and really reads the room when it comes to what's going on in Congress. And he says that he, that he they're of the view that TikTok issue gets dealt with by year's end. But how? How it gets done, that's what matters in the Senate. Do they give carte blanche power to potentially the president to deal with companies like this? Or... Is there another avenue they can go on? So there's a lot of questions surrounding it, but it does feel like it's a make or break moment for TikTok because the House overwhelmingly was for this and now it's going to the Senate and they've moved a provision. It was supposed to be six months they had to divest or ban. Now it's one year long. So basically it gets everyone through the election and then they can figure out what to do. It, it's really interesting how the news cycle has almost been trumped, excuse the pun. $95 billion worth of aid was put through. This was a busy week in Congress. Speaker Johnson, we don't know whether you know, he's going run to run into more problems. Explain to me the significance of the $95 billion of aid that was for Taiwan, for Ukraine, and for Israel. Well, this is going to likely get passed in the Senate, no doubt about that, when it comes to the aid for these American partners. I thought was very interesting is look at the margins of the aid in terms of how they were being passed. Ukraine was the hardest to get through. You had the most amount of no's. So you could still see a lot of individuals, Speaker Johnson's party, a lot of Republicans, conservatives, who are still questioning why the United States is sending money and funding Ukraine, which is why his job potentially is on precarious footing for the rest of the year. And it was what Marjorie Taylor, I just saw a clip of her, uh, the ultra conservative, nothing is being done to secure our border or reduce our debt. I mean, that just, identifies and, and, and personifies the, far, the, the right hand, the ultra-conservative uh, side of this argument, doesn't it? Yeah, and the question is whether or not she actually, there actually would be a vote to motion to vacate, similar to what the hard right flank of the party did for former Speaker McCarthy. Will Speaker Johnson face the same fate? But after this, these bills are done, there's really not much for Congress to do. After the Senate signs off on this, it's going to be full-on election mode. You haven't had enough of it yet. I can't wait to live <laughs> through this entire election cycle with you. I'm Marie Hordern. Uh, she'll be with us for every twist and turn, uh, taking us through TikTok and the bills on the hill. Uh, Abigail Doolittle is with me. Uh, what have we got, Abby, in terms of the sector action? Well, for the S&P 500 itself, we're looking at the first update in seven days based on broad gains for most sectors. Tech is the best sector up 1.2%. NVIDIA, the top leader, after dropping 10% on Friday alone, the worst day since 2020. Microsoft, Apple, Broadcom also higher relative to other sectors, trading higher communication services and discretionary. So those three mega cap tech sectors are leading the way today. Materials and energy, uh, the worst sectors. Relative to tech, though, over the last seven days, it's really taken a, a bit of a hit. Chips in particular, the Sox man is over the last seven days down more than 10%. The worst seven days, not since October of 2023, but October of 2022. And if you recall, that was a really brutal year of selling. So that's the degree of selling we have been seeing today. A little bit of dip buying. Let's see whether or not it lasts. Abby, thank you very much. That's the sector watch for you. We'll get you up to speed with the events that will set your agenda right here with your trading diary on Bloomberg.
Breathe easy, everybody. NVIDIA is up 4%. That's what's giving a little bit of spirit to these markets. It was down 10%, $200 billion wiped out on Friday. The broader market up four tenths of 1%. All eyes down. Tesla chaos is the talk of the town and on the street. You trade your diary. Looks a little bit like this. The Treasury kicks off a busy slate of auctions this afternoon. And then it is Tesla. The earnings and the US PMIs on Tuesday. IBM and Meta are out with their results on Wednesday. Thursday, we get into Alphabet, Microsoft, and then you've got US GDP and another round of jobless claims taking you through to the final swan song on Friday. You Mitch sentiment survey and the all importer PCE deflator to wrap up the week. So that is your trading diary. Let's see what Elon Musk delivers tomorrow in terms of the price cutting that he did at the weekend, the risk to the job uh, and the head count there. That was countdown to the open. The team will take you through the rest of your trading day on Bloomberg. Context matters.